First thing I do is cross off the missing teeth on the cast, or on the paper that resemble the cast. And our design, we called for a clasp assembly on this canine, and the canine has to have a cingulum rest. We also called for an indirect retainer, which would be a cingulum rest on this central incisor. Now we don't put uh, indirect retainers on lateral incisors on the maxillary, and we don't put them on any of the incisors on the mandibular. We would have a rest next to our edentulous area where this clasp assembly is going to be located and where this clasp assembly is going to be located. Now, on our canine, a guide plate, because we're going to have a raw wire clasp on here, uh, our guide plate would come up here, and then we would have plating that would cover that cingulum, swing up to the embrasure, cover every cingulum, swing up to the embrasure, go from contact point to contact point, and then we're going to plate this premolar over on this side and that um, would have a slight guide plate right there. Now, our metal will come around this rest. It will become the superior border of our direct retainer here, and then the inferior border will come back and go down as a guide plate, and we'll place a little crosshatch to indicate our direct retention is on the buckle surface, even though it's pretty obvious because that's plating. On this molar, we're going to be coming around this rest with our, our metal will be a, a cover that rest, obviously. It will come, the superior border will come back, grab our distal facial point of one undercut, will come back, and it will go down as a guide plate right in that area. And if we're placing a tube tooth, this guide plate and this guide plate would be connected with an external finish line. On the lingual of that tooth, that guide plate area, or right there at that distal lingual line angle, we would bring the metal back. You should leave room to at least have a tooth as wide as the uh, tooth that needs to be replaced. And with a tube tooth, we're going to have a circle right in the middle that represents the nail head that holds the denture tooth on. Now, this rest becomes our, our reciprocal component, which in this case we're going to do plating. Now, our major connector will swing back from here. We can choose if we wanted to uh, to end our major connector here and put an arm on that tooth, but then we'd be swinging across the palate like this with the back portion of our major connector, the posterior border, and patients don't like obliquely crossing frameworks. They want symmetry. It needs to cross the midline perpendicular to it. On the Extension bay side, our major connector must go all the way back and our uh, framework and acrylic have to go into the hamular notch. So we're going to come straight back, but we're not going to go into that hamular notch because we want acrylic to be over that area uh, to allow for a good junction and it makes for better adjustment if it's putting pressure in that area. So we're going to come up here like this and our base, our base attachment will come forward and come up at this guide plate right here. Now, um, that's going to be base attachment. That's an external finish line. And we will have holes, large openings in that. And then in this part, we'll come forward a little bit for a processing or a tissue stop, as it's called, depending on your textbook. Now let's draw our, we could have drawn our acrylic first, but our acrylic will basically be like this. It's going to come in and it's going to butt up against that external finish line, and then it's going to come down here and go to the depth of the vestibule or to any place where we have a real large undercut. It'll stop there. So this is our acrylic that we would see on the tongue side. On the tissue side, there will be another junction of that acrylic on that internal finish line. So we would show that 
by an internal finish line on this side. This is the external finish line, which is like a little butt joint so that the acrylic can end and not be like nail polish. It's just a little layer that could flick off. It will have a nice butt joint. On the tissue side, there is another butt joint, again, so that the acrylic can come to a smooth transition and end and not have flash that extends onto the major connector. This is the internal finish line. Our major connector then is going to come from that. It has to go to the hem inner notch here. And it'll come across, and we'd like to cross the palette perpendicular. We do not want to go past the vibrating line. It has to be on the uh, anterior side of the vibrating line, or else the palette will lift up away from the framework and water and debris will get under this partial framework very easily. So we kind of come across perpendicular and then we're going to swing up and connect to our guide plate, or our reciprocal component right there. Now in this we're going to place a very large hole which we can do and the patient would love to have as much tissue exposed as possible but we do have to have this back bar to be a minimum of 8 to 10 millimeters in width and on this anterior portion we don't want to end the the border of the hole right up here in the front um, close to that area because this is what we call our speech zone and I'm going to put a little S right here to just remind you that it's a speech zone because you would not want that tongue butting up against this ledge and that's another important reason for placement of this border uh, in the valley between the rugae so that it becomes flush. You don't want it to cross a hump of the rugae and end right there. You want it to go to the more posterior rugae end at that point because then the thickness makes it become confluent with the top of the rugae and you don't feel that um, tissue problem there. I do have a, a framework here that kind of simulates this to some extent and this is basically the framework that we have drawn different finish lines but it has another modification space in the anterior area but this is our class two now one thing to get a, a, a feeling about this we need this to be eight to ten millimeters in width and the reason is this tissue all below here is real flabby and if we have a fulcrum line along here and this tissue is very flabby in this area and we push down on it. If this is very narrow, like just a little tiny bar, then as you bite, you're putting a lot of pressure on that hard palate right in that area. And it can become quite sore if you don't have adequate width to that posterior strap that's on the major connector. So let's see if we've forgotten something. We have forgotten something here. We're going to have some um, a rot wire we decided on this tooth and that rot wire would be soldered back here and it would come forward, it would come up along the marginal ridge there and it would go to the mesial facial. Now the rot wire is drawn as a single line. That's how a laboratory person might know that you want a rot wire because there is a difference. This is our cast circumferential with an outlined clasp this is our rot wire with a single line. Our acrylic on that tube tooth, the acrylic can actually have a finish line right along here, butting up, they, they make a little ledge on this, and uh, that wasn't, I thought I had a framework that with that, but um, there'd be a ledge here that this acrylic becomes a butt joint to it, and if you want that little silver ledge out there, then your acrylic would end like this. Now on a maxillary, if you're putting a tube tooth, you probably want the tube uh, tooth itself to butt up against the ridge versus having a little metal ledge there that isn't as aesthetic. So we sometimes bring the acrylic finish line down like this so that they butt the tooth up against the ridge versus against a finish line that uh, 
makes for less aesthetics, and that's especially true on the maxillary. We would be more concerned about aesthetics on that premolar. So I think I have everything on this particular cast. Here is another option that I'll present to you, but it is not as stable as the one previously presented. Sometimes patients want less metal or you want to give them less metal and this design would do that. Instead of the um, indirect retainer being on our central incisor, I have moved it over to the canine. Now that doesn't provide a whole lot of um, prevention of rotation because it's awfully close to the fulcrum line. Remember that the indirect retainer, which is necessary on a Kennedy class 1 and 2, it needs to be as far away from the fulcrum line as is possible. And that would be if it were located up there on that central incisor. We do not put indirect retainers on lateral incisors on the maxillary nor do we put them on any of the incisors on the mandibular. The other difference that I did in this particular design is that I placed a wrought wire on this premolar because if we look at our fulcrum line and you think about some thick fibrous tissue on this side and this gets depressed under masticatory function, then the tooth that will take the uh, largest beating would be this tooth over in this position. So a wrought wire would be beneficial to prevent rotation or to prevent uh, torquing on that particular tooth. Um, I also ended my major connector farther forward and came across the arch in this way straight across and then swung my major connector back somewhat. I also stopped them. I did not plate all these anterior teeth, which if this tooth were missing, that would be absolutely necessary to plate all of these teeth here. The fact that I have a molar posterior doesn't, it gives a little bit more stability with this molar present. But I came from canine down, dipped away, came back up to my canine on this side. The thing to think about here is if you do in fact avoid that, uh, those teeth, then you must avoid the marginal gingiva by a minimum of six millimeters on a maxillary arch. But also in this anterior area, you need to think about where the tongue goes to form all the sounds. And if this end and thickness of the major connector is in this area really close to these incisors, uh, the sounds like the TH sounds would possibly be distorted and the tongue would be quite annoyed by this ledge that is placed right here. If we dip down, we wish to dip down between the valley of the rugae and you would want to dip down and you would want to place the anterior border of this major connector right behind this prominent rugae. The reason being is that the metal would have some thickness and if you place it here it would just blend into that protuberance of soft tissue and would not be noticeable. If you end it over the top of it then that little lump of tissue seems three times as big as if you handle it the other way. Also on this one, I did a facing which is drawn as a straight line from guide plate to guide plate and placed an F out on our uh, land area or on the cast to tell us that we are putting a facing in that area. If you do this, it could be confused with the metal tooth which is drawn exactly the same way. So you need to indicate a facing. Again, I want to reiterate that this design is not as stable as the one that we placed up here. But if you're interested in giving a patient something with less metal, 
then this would be the way that you would want to go.